Welcome to the Sleep Charming Podcast, the podcast where I help you drift off for a good night's sleep or simply take a moment to relax. If you're enjoying the podcast, please leave a review or a rating. So sit back, take a deep breath, and let me read you an old story. In your school days, most of you who read this book made acquaintance with the noble building of Euclid's geometry. And you remember, perhaps with more respect than love, the magnificent structure on the lofty staircases of which you were chased about for uncounted hours by conscientious teachers. By reason of our past experience, you would certainly regard everyone with disdain who should pronounce even the most out-of-the-way proposition of this science to be untrue. But perhaps this proud feeling of certainty would leave you immediately if someone were to ask you, what then do you mean by the assertion that these propositions are true? Let us proceed to give this question a little consideration. Geometry sets out form certain conceptions, such as plane, point, and straight line, with which we are able to associate more or less definite ideas. And from certain simple propositions, axioms, which in virtue of these ideas, we are inclined to accept as true. Then, on the basis of a logical process, the justification of which we feel ourselves compelled to admit, all remaining propositions are shown to follow from those axioms, i.e. they are proven. A proposition is then correct or true when it has been derived in the recognised manner from the axioms. The question of truth of the individual geometrical propositions is thus reduced to one of the truth of the axioms. Now it has long been known that the last question is not only unanswerable by the methods of geometry, but that it is in itself entirely without meaning. We cannot ask whether it is true that only one straight line goes through two points. We can only say that Euclidean geometry deals with the things called straight lines, to each of which is ascribed the property of being uniquely determined by two points situated on it. The concept true does not tally with the assertions of pure geometry because the word true we are eventually in the habit of designating always a correspondence with a real object. Geometry, however, is not concerned with the relation of the ideas involved to the objects of experience, but only with the logical connection of these ideas among themselves. It is not difficult to understand why, in spite of this, we feel constrained to call the propositions of geometry true. Geometrical ideas correspond to more or less exact objects in nature, and these last are undoubtedly the exclusive cause of the genesis of those ideas. Geometry ought to refrain from such a course in order to give its structure the largest possible logical unity. The practice, for example, of seeing in a distance two marked positions on a practically rigid body is something which is lodged deeply in our habit of thought. We are accustomed further to regard three points as being situated on a straight line if their apparent positions can be made to coincide for observation with one eye under suitable choice of our place of observation. If, in the pursuance of our habit of thought, we now supplement the propositions of Euclidean geometry by the single proposition that two points on a practically rigid body always corresponds to the same distance, line interval, independently of any changes in position to which we may subject the body. The propositions of Euclidean geometry then resolve themselves into propositions on the possible relative position of practically rigid bodies. Geometry which has been supplemented in this way is then to be treated as a branch of physics. We can now legitimately ask as to the truth of geometrical propositions interpreted in this way. Since we are justified in asking whether these propositions are satisfied, 
for those real things we have associated with the geometrical ideas. We can now legitimately ask as to the truth of the geometrical positions interpreted in this way, since we are justified in asking whether these propositions are satisfied with those real things we have associated with the geometrical ideas. In less exact terms, we can express this by saying that the truth of a geometrical proposition, in this sense we understand its validity for a construction with rule and compasses. Of course, the conviction of the truth of geometrical propositions, in this sense, is founded exclusively on rather incomplete experiences. For the present, we shall assume the truth of the geometrical propositions. Then, at a later stage, in the general theory of relativity, we shall see that this truth is limited, and we shall consider the extent of its limitation. The system of coordinates. On the basis of the physical interpretation of distance, which has been indicated, we are also in a position to establish the distance between two points on a rigid body by means of measurement. For this purpose, we require a distance, which is to be used once and for all, and which we employ as a standard measure. If now, A and B are two points on a rigid body, we can construct the line joining them according to the rules of geometry. Then, starting from A, we can mark off the distance, S, time after time until we reach B. The number of these operations required is the numerical measure of the distance, A, B. This is the basis of all measurement of length. Every description of the scene of an event or of the position of an object in space is based on the specification of the point on a rigid body, body of reference, with which that event or object coincides. This applies not only to the scientific description, but also to everyday life. If I analyse the place specification, Times Square, New York, I arrive at the following result. The Earth is the rigid body to which the specification of place refers. Times Square, New York, is a well-defined point to which a name has been assigned, and with which the event coincides in space. This primitive method of place specification deals only with places on the surface of rigid bodies, and is dependent on the existence of points on the surface which are distinguishable from each other. But we can free ourselves from both of these limitations without altering the nature of our specification of position. If, for existence, a cloud is hovering over Times Square, then we can determine its position relative to the surface of the Earth by erecting a pole perpendicularly on the square, so that it reaches the cloud. The length of the pole measured with the standard measuring rod, combined with the specification of the position of the foot of the pole, supplies us with a complete place specification. We are able to see the manner in which a refinement of the conception of position has been developed. A. We imagine the rigid body to which the place specification is referred, supplemented in such a manner that the object whose position we require is reached by the completed rigid body. B. In locating the position of the object, we make use of a number, here the length of the pole, measured with the measuring rod. Instead of designating points of reference, we speak of the height of the cloud even when the pole which reaches the cloud has not been erected. By means of optical observations of the cloud from different positions on the ground, and taking into account the properties of the propagation of light. We determine the length of the pole we should have required in order to reach the cloud. From this consideration, we see that it will be advantageous if in the description of position, it should be possible, by means of numerical measures, to make ourselves independent of the existence 
of marked positions possessing names on the rigid body of reference. In the physics of measurement, this is attained by the application of the Cartesian system of coordinates. This consists of three plane surfaces perpendicular to each other and rigidly attached to a rigid body. Referred to a system of coordinates, the scene from any event will be determined, for the main part, by the specification of the lengths of the three perpendiculars or coordinates, which can be dropped from the scene of the event to those three plane surfaces. The lengths of these three perpendiculars can be determined by a series of manipulations with rigid measuring rods performed accordingly to the rules and methods laid down by Euclidean geometry. In practice, the rigid surfaces which constitute the systems of coordinates are generally not available. Furthermore, the magnitudes of the coordinates are not actually determined by constructions with rigid rods but by indirect means. If the results of physics and astronomy are to maintain their clearness, the physical meaning of specifications of position must always be sought in accordance with the above considerations. We thus obtain the following result. Every description of events in space involves the use of a rigid body to which such events have to be referred. The resulting relationship takes for granted that the laws of Euclidean geometry hold for distances, the distance being represented physically by means of the convention of two marks on a rigid body. Space and time in classical mechanics. The purpose of mechanics is to describe how bodies change their position in space with time. I should load my conscience with the grave sins against the sacred spirit of lucidity were I to formulate the aims of mechanics in this way. Without serious reflection and detailed explanations, let us proceed to disclose these sins. It is not clear what is to be understood here by position and space. I stand at the window of a railway carriage which is travelling uniformly and I drop a stone on the embankment without throwing it. Then, disregarding the influence of the air resistance, I see the stone descend in a straight line. A pedestrian who observes the misdeed from the footpath notices that the stone falls to earth in a parabolic curve. I now ask, do the positions traversed by the stone lie in reality on a straight line or on a parabola. Moreover, what is meant by the motion in space? From the considerations of the previous section, the answer is self-evident. In the first place, we entirely shun the vague word space, of which we must honestly acknowledge. We cannot form the slightest conception, and we replace it by motion relative to a practically rigid body of reference. The positions relative to the body of reference, railway carriage or embankment, have already been defined in detail in the preceding section. If instead of body of reference, we insert system of coordinates, which is a useful idea for mathematical description, we are in a position to say the stone traverses a straight line relative to a system of coordinates rigidly attached to the carriage, but relatively to a system of coordinates rigidly attached to the ground embankment, it describes a parabola. With the aid of this example, it is clearly seen that there is no such thing as an independent existing trajectory but only a trajectory relative to a particular body of reference. In order to have a complete description of the motion, we must specify how the body alters its position with time, i.e. for every point on the trajectory, it must be stated at what time the body is situated there. 
These data must be supplemented by such a definition of time that in virtue of its definition, these time's values can be regarded essentially as magnitudes, results of measurements capable of observation. If we take our stand on the ground of classical mechanics, we can satisfy this requirement for our illustration in the following manner. We imagine two clocks of identical construction. The man at the railway carriage window is holding one of them, and the man on the footpath the other. Each of the observers determines the position on his own reference body occupied by the stone at each tick of the clock he is holding in his hand. In this connection, we have not taken account of the inaccuracy involved by the finiteness of the velocity of propagation of light. With this, and with a second difficulty prevailing here, we shall have to deal in detail later. The Galilean System of Coordinates As is well known, the fundamental law of the mechanics of Galilee, Newton, which is known as the law of inertia, can be stated thus. A body removed sufficiently far from other bodies continues in a state of rest or of uniform motion in a straight line. This law not only says something about the motion of the bodies, but it also indicates the reference bodies or systems of coordinates permissible in mechanics, which can be used in mechanical description. The visible fixed stars are bodies for which the law of inertia certainly holds to a high degree of approximation. Now, if we use a system of coordinates, which is rigidly attached to the Earth, then, relative to this system, every fixed star describes a circle of immense radius in the course of an astronomical day, a result which is opposed to the statement of the law of inertia, so that if we adhere to this law, we must refer these motions only to systems of coordinates relative to which the fixed stars do not move in a circle. A system of coordinates of which the state of motion is such that the law of inertia holds relative to it is called a Galilean system of coordinates. The laws of the mechanics of the Galilean Newton can be regarded as valid only for Galilean systems of coordinates. The principle of relativity in the restricted sense. In order to attain the greatest possible clearness, let us return to our example of the railway carriage supposed to be travelling uniformly. We call its motion a uniform translation. Uniform because of its constant velocity and direction. Translation because although the carriage changes its position relative to the embankment, yet it does not rotate in doing so. Let us imagine a raven flying through the air in such a manner that its motion, as observed from the embankment, is uniform and in a straight line. If we were to observe the flying raven from the moving railway carriage, we should find that the motion of the raven would be one of different velocity and direction, but that it would still be uniform and in a straight line. Expressed in an abstract manner, we may say, if a mass, M, is moving uniformly in a straight line with respect to a coordinate system K, then it will also be moving uniformly in a straight line relative to a second coordinate system, provided that the latter is executing a uniform translationary motion with respect to K. In accordance with the discussion contained in the preceding section, it follows that if K is a Galilean coordinate system, then every other coordinate system is a Galilean one. When in relation to K, in relation to K, it is in a condition of uniform motion of translation. Relative to K, the mechanical laws of Galilei Newton hold good exactly as they do with respect to K. We advance a step further in our generalization when we express the tenet thus. If relative to K, 
K is a uniformly moving coordinate system, devoid of rotation. The natural phenomena run their course with respect to K, according to exactly the same general laws as with respect to K. This statement is called the principle of relativity in the restricted sense. As long as one was convinced that all natural phenomena were capable of representation with the help of classical mechanics, there was no need to doubt the validity of this principle of relativity. But in a view of the more recent development of electrodynamics and optics, it became more and more evident that classical mechanics affords an insufficient foundation for the physical description of all natural phenomena. At this juncture, the question of validity of the principle of relativity became ripe for discussion, and it did not appear impossible that the answer to this question might be in the negative. Nevertheless, there are two general facts which at the outset speak very much in favour of the validity of the principle of relativity. Even though the classical mechanics does not supply us with a sufficiently broad basis for the theoretical representation of all physical phenomena, still we must grant it a considerable measure of truth, since it supplies us with the actual motions of the heavenly bodies with a delicacy of detail little short of wonderful. The principle of relativity must therefore apply with great accuracy in the domain of mechanics, but that a principle of such broad generality should hold with such exactness in one domain of phenomena, and yet should be invalid for another. It is a priori not very probable. We now proceed to the second argument, to which moreover we shall return later. If the principle of relativity, in the restricted sense, does not hold, then the Galilean coordinate systems, which are moving uniformly relative to each other, will not be equivalent for the description of natural phenomena. In this case, we should be constrained to believe that natural laws are capable of being formulated in a particularly simple manner, and of course only on condition that, from amongst all possible Galilean coordinate systems, we should have chosen one of a particular state of motion as our body of reference. We should then be justified, because of its merits for the description of natural phenomena, in calling the system absolutely at rest, and all other Galilean systems in motion. If, for instance, our embankment were the system, then our railway carriage would be a system K, relative to which less simple laws would hold than with respect to. This diminished simplicity would be due to the fact that carriage K would be in motion, i.e. really, with respect to. In the general rules of nature, which have been formulated with reference to K, the magnitude and direction of the velocity of the carriage would necessarily play a part. We should expect, for instance, that the note emitted by an organ pipe placed with its axis parallel to the direction of travel would be different from that emitted if the axis of the pipe were placed perpendicular to this direction. Now in virtue of its motion in an orbit around the sun, our Earth is comparable with a railway carriage travelling a velocity of about 30 kilometres per second. If the principle of relativity were not valid, we should therefore expect that the direction of motion of the Earth at any moment would enter into the laws of nature, and also that physical systems in their behaviour would be dependent on the orientation in space with respect to the Earth. For owing to the alteration in direction of the velocity of revolution of the Earth in the course of a year, the Earth cannot be at rest relative to the hypothetical system throughout the whole year. However, the most careful observations have never revealed such anisotropic properties in terrestrial physical space, i.e. a physical non-equivalence of different directions. This is a very powerful argument in favour of the principle of relativity.